Chapter 10. Transgression and Marriage and an Orgy. Marriage seen as a transgression and the right of entry. Marriage is most often thought of as having little to do with eroticism. We use the word eroticism every time a human being behaves in a way strongly contrasted with everyday standards and behaviour. Eroticism shows the other side of a facade of unimpeachable propriety. Behind the facade are revealed the feelings, part of the body and habits we are normally ashamed of. It must be stressed that, although this aspect has apparently nothing to do with marriage, it has in fact always been present in it. Marriage in the first place is the framework of legitimate sensuality. Thou shalt not perform the carnal act except in matrimony alone. In even the most Puritan societies, marriage is not questioned. But I have in mind the quality of transgression that persists at the very basis of marriage. This may seem a contradiction at first, but we must remember the other cases of transgression entirely in keeping with the general sense of the law transgressed. Sacrifice, particularly, as in essence, as we have seen, the ritual violation of a taboo. The whole process of religion entails the paradox of a rule regularly broken in certain circumstances. I take marriage to be a transgression, then. This is a paradox, no doubt, but laws that allow an infringement and consider it legal are paradoxical. Hence, just as killing is simultaneously forbidden and performed in sacrificial ritual, so the initial sexual act constituting marriage is a permitted violation. Near relations, having exclusive rights over sisters and daughters, would perhaps relinquish these rights to strangers who, coming from outside, had a kind of irregularity about them that qualified them to undertake the act of transgression, which the first act of intercourse in marriage was taken to be. This is only a hypothesis, but if we want to see how marriage fits into the sphere of eroticism, such a possibility is not to be neglected. In any case, that there is a feeling of transgression about marriage is a matter of everyday experience. Popular wedding celebrations alone make that much clear. Sexual intercourse in a marriage or outside it has always something of the nature of a criminal act, particularly where a virgin is concerned, and always to some extent when it takes place for the first time. With this in mind, I think it makes sense to talk about a certain power of transgression a stranger would have, and a man living in the same community would not possess. Recourse to a power of transgression not possessed by the first comer seems generally to have been favoured, especially on serious occasions like a, the violation of a taboo making copulation a shameful thing when it is practised with a woman for the first time. That operation would often be entrusted to men who, unlike the bridegroom, had the authority to transgress. They must have had a quality of sovereignty in some way or another that protected them from the taboo valid for mankind in general. The priesthood would be the obvious choice, but in the Christian world it was out of the question to have recourse to God's ministers, and the custom of entrusting the defloration to the local lord grew up. Footnote. In any case, the jus prime noctus, which the feudal lord affected as the sovereign power in his domain, was not as being thought the outrageous privilege of a tyrant in who no one dared resist. At least, it did not originate in that way. Sexual intercourse, or the initial act at least, was evidently considered forbidden and dangerous, but the lord or the priest had the power to touch sacred things without too great a risk. Repetition the erotic side, or more simply, the transgressional aspect of marriage, often escapes notice because the word marriage describes both the act of getting married and the state of being married. We forget the former and just think of the latter. Besides, the economic value of woman has long made the state of marriage the most important thing. Calculations, expectations, and results have focused interest on the state at the expense of the intensity of feeling that characterizes the brief moment of the act. It is different in kind from the expectations it raises. The home, the children, and the domestic activity which will result. The most serious thing is that habit dulls intensity and marriage implies habit. 
there is a remarkable connection between the innocence and the absence of danger offered by repeated intercourse. The first act being the only one to fear, and the absence of value on the level of pleasure generally associated with this repetition. This is no negligible connection, it has to do with the very essence of eroticism. But the full flowering of sexual life is not negligible either. Without the intimate understanding between two bodies that only grows with time, conjunction is furtive and superficial, unorganised, practically animal and far too quick, and often the expected pleasure fails to come. A taste for constant change is certainly neurotic, and certainly can only lead to frustration after frustration. Habit, on the other hand, is able to deepen the experiences that impatience scorns to bother with. With repetition, the two opposing viewpoints are complementary. Without a doubt, the aspects, the signs and the symbols which give eroticism its richness demand a certain basic irregularity. Carnal life would be a poor thing, not far removed from the animal's heavy-footed endeavours if it had never been indulged in with a fair amount of freedom to, in response to capricious urges. While it is true that sexual life blossoms with habit, it is hard to say how far a happy life prolongs the sensations roused in the first instance by a troubled impulse, or revealed by forbidden explorations. Habit itself owes something to the higher pitch of excitement dependent on disorder and rule-breaking. We can ask whether the deep love kept alive in marriage would be possible without the contagion of illicit love, the only kind able to give love a greater force than that of law. Ritual Orgy In any case, the orderly framework of marriage provides only a narrow outlet for pent-up violence. Apart from marriage, feast days provided opportunities for rule-breaking and at the same time made possible normal life dedicated to orderly activity. Even the holiday on the death of a king that I mentioned fixed a limit in time to apparently boundless disorder in spite of its prolonged and amorphous nature. Once the royal remains had become a skeleton, disorder and excess ceased to prevail and taboos came into force once more. Ritual orgies, often connected with less disorderly feasts, allowed for only a furtive interruption of the taboo on sexual behaviour. Often the licence extended only to members of a fraternity, as in the Dionysic feasts, but it might well have a more precise religious connotation, transcending eroticism. We do not know exactly what used to take place. We can always imagine a heavy vulgarity taking the place of frenzy, but it is no use denying the possibility of a state of exaltation composed of the intoxication commonly accompanying the orgy, erotic ecstasy and religious ecstasy. In the orgy, the celebration progresses with the overwhelming force that usually brushes all bonds aside. In itself, the feast is a denial of the limits set on life by work, but the orgy turns everything upside down. It is not by chance that the social order used to be turned topsy-turvy during the Saturnalia, the master serving the slave, the slave lolling on the master's bed. These excesses derive their most acute significance from the ancient connection between sensual pleasure and religious exaltation. This is the direction given to eroticism by the orgy, no matter what order was involved, making it transcend animal sexuality. There is nothing of this sort in the rudimentary eroticism of marriage. Transgression, yes, whether violent or not, but transgression in marriage is without consequence. It is independent of other developments, possible ones no doubt, but not imposed by custom or even frowned on by custom. One might just possibly consider the vogue of dirty jokes in our own day as having something of the marriage ceremony about it at a popular level. But this custom implies an inhibited eroticism turned into furtive sallies, sly allusions and humorous double meanings. Sexual frenzy, though, with its religious overtones, is the true stuff of orgies. A very old aspect of eroticism is seen in the orgy. Orgiacal eroticism is, by nature, a dangerous excess whose explosive contagion is an indiscriminate threat to all sides of life. 
The original rites made the maenads devour their own living infants in their ferocious frenzy. Later on, this abomination was echoed in the bloody omophagia of kids first suckled by the maenads. The orgy is not associated with the dignity of religion, extracting from the underlying violence something calm and majestic, compatible with profane order. Its potency is seen in its ill-omened aspects, bringing frenzy in its wake, a vertiginous loss of consciousness. The total personality is involved, reeling blindly towards annihilation, and this is the decisive moment of religious feeling. All this occurs within the framework of man's secondary ascent in the measureless proliferation of life. The refusal implied by taboos confines the individual within a miserly isolation, compared with the vast disorder of creatures lost in each other, whose very violence lays them open to the violence of death. From another standpoint, the suspension of taboos sets free the exuberant surge of life, and favours the unbounded, orgiastic fusion of those individuals. This fusion could in no way be limited to that attendant on the plethora of the genital organs. It is a religious effusion first and foremost. It is essentially the disorder of lost beings who oppose no further resistance to the frantic proliferation of life. That enormous unleashing of natural forces seems to be divine. So high does it raise man above the condition to which he has condemned himself of his own accord. Wild cries, wild violence of gesture, wild dances, wild emotions as well, all in the grip of immeasurably convulsive turbulence. The perdition ahead would demand this flight into the regions where all individuality is shed, where the stable elements of human activity disappear and there is no firm foothold anywhere to be found. The orgy as an agrarian ritual. The orgies of archaic peoples are usually interpreted in a way that completely bypasses everything that I have tried to show. Before proceeding then I must discuss the traditional interpretation which tends to reduce them to rituals of contagious magic. The men who ordained these orgies did indeed believe that they ensured the fertility of the fields. No one doubts that this is so. But the whole story has not been told if practices which far surpass the necessities of an agrarian rite are explained only in terms of that rite. Even if orgies had at all times and everywhere had this meaning, one would still be justified in inquiring whether this was their only meaning. To comprehend the agrarian aspect of a custom is indisputably of interest in that it thereby becomes part of the history of agricultural civilization. But it is ingenuous to see all the actions accounted for by a belief in their efficacy. Work and material utility have certainly determined, or at any rate conditioned, the behaviour, religious as well as profane, of semi-civilised peoples. But that does not mean that an extravagant custom derives specifically from a wish to make plantations fertile. Work set up the distinction between the sacred and the profane. It is the origin of the taboos which made man deny nature. On the other hand, the limits of this working world supported and maintained in the struggle against nature by those taboos also delineated the sacred world. In one way, the sacred world is nothing but the natural world persisting in so far as it cannot be entirely reduced to the order laid down by work. Profane order, that is. But the sacred world is only the natural world in one sense. In another, it transcends the earlier world made up of work and taboos. In this sense, the sacred world is a denial of the profane, yet it also owes its character to the profane world it denies. The sacred world is also the result of work in that its origin and significance are to be sought not in the immediate existence of nature's creation, but in the birth of a new order of things brought about in turn by the opposition to nature of the world of purposeful activity. The sacred world is separated from nature by work. It would be unintelligible for us if we did not see how far work determines its nature and existence. The human mind, formed by work, would usually attribute to action a usefulness analogous to that of work. 
in the sacred world, the explosion of violence suppressed by a taboo was regarded not only as an explosion, but also as an action, and was considered to have some use. Originally such explosions, like war or sacrifice or orgies, were not calculated ones, but as transgressions perpetrated by men, they were organised explosions. They were actions whose possible use appeared as a secondary consideration and were not contested. The effects of war as an act were of the same order as the effects of work. In sacrifice there came into play forces to which consequences were arbitrarily attributed, just as if the force were that of a tool handled by a man. The effects attributed to orgies are of a different order. In human affairs, example is catching. A man enters the dance because the dance makes him dance. A contagious action, and this one really is contagious, was thought to affect not only other men but nature as well. So sexual activity, which can be considered by and large as growth, as I have said, was thought to encourage growth in vegetation. But only secondarily is transgression and action undertaken because of its usefulness. In war, in sacrifice or in orgies, the human mind arranged a convulsive explosion, banking on the real or imaginary result. War is not a political enterprise in origin, nor sacrifice a piece of magic. Similarly, the orgy did not originate in the desire for abundant crops. The origins of war, sacrifice and orgy are identical. They spring from the existence of taboos set up to counter liberty and murder or sexual violence. These taboos inevitably shaped the explosive surge of transgression. All this does not mean that recourse was never had to the orgy, or war or sacrifice, for the sake of the results rightly or wrongly attributed to them. But in that case it was a secondary and inevitable business of frantic violence hurled in amongst the wheels of human activity as organised by work. Violence in these conditions is no longer a purely natural and animal affair. The explosion preceded by anguish takes on a divine significance, transcending immediate satisfaction. It has become a religious matter, but in the same movement it also becomes human. It finds its place in the chain of cause and effect that communal efforts have built up upon the foundation of work.